Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I am Bree Noble, and I am here with my friend Isabella Bedoya from Fame Hackers. And we're going to be getting into some juicy stuff today because... I know that I've been wanting to cover this for a while on the podcast and I needed to find the right person to do it. And once I heard Isabella talk about this stuff, I'm like, she is the right person because I I just, I have so many questions about everything related to NFTs. I know that is like the big buzzword right now, NFTs and then the metaverse and web three and what in the world is all of that. And, you know, so I think we've all kind of, heard bits and pieces of what all this stuff is and what it means for our future. But I really believe that Isabella is going to be able to lay this out for us today in language that we can all understand. Cause I know, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. Like I know that a lot of people that listen to this podcast or maybe a little bit more, you know, I have, I have a good gamut of everybody that listens, but there are people that are like me that are a little bit on the older side that, you know, technology might seem a little bit challenging and now they're throwing all this stuff at us. Right. So we want to understand what is happening and, and be able to be knowledgeable about this stuff so we can decide whether it makes sense for us or not. So with that being said, um, Isabella, I'd love to give, have you guys give them just a little background on, you know, how, you got into the music business and how you got into working with all of this web three stuff now. Um, and then we'll get into all of the specifics. Sounds awesome. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, and just kind of to give a little backstory. So I got into the music industry really creatively. I used to be a private chef and then that somehow landed me uh, gig in LA. So as soon as I moved Wait a minute, to LA, how did I not know this? We should have had you making us like special food at our mastermind <laughs> meetings. I don't think a lot of people do. When I share it, people go like, whoa, that's so cool. Um, but yeah, I used to, back in the day, I used to be a private chef and it really, social media has always been around, revolving around my life because it was thanks to social media that I actually got a job as a live-in chef in Beverly Hills. So I had to fly out to LA and it was awesome, but that is how I actually got into the music industry because as soon as I moved to LA, my end goal was always music. So I just hit the floor running and I went to like every networking event that I could find on Facebook back then. Remember like Facebook events? So oh, yeah. <laughs> I went to like every single event in LA and I started just meeting people and industry people and I ended up landing a job as, as an A&R for a label under Sony. So that was kind of my little back way entrance and then ever since then i still realized social media was like the biggest factor even as we transition into like nfts and web3 it's still all surrounding social media so that's kind of been my journey wow that's awesome and so i know that um one of your major focuses with fame hackers is is helping people to build a fan base and before we get into all the specifics around all this web3 stuff and nfts like can you make the connection for everybody in like, why is it important for them to build their fan base in order to be able to take advantage of all these things that are available to us in web three? Yeah, that's a really good question. So when you think about like where we are with the, let's just actually take it back to like the creation creators economy. Um, it's important because like right now we are going through, we're like, if I kind of like peel it back to like the first layer of creators economy, this is kind of like the rise of social media, right? This is like early 2000s, Facebook, Instagram, uh, MySpace and all those things, Twitter. And then the second era, the second wave of it, it was when influencers started coming around, right? And influencers started growing their audience and stuff like that. And brands saw the opportunity of like, Hey, we can monetize those audiences. 
So really like the uh, creator's economy wave two really was when influencers started coming around. Then era three, like the third generation of creator's economy, which is what we're in right now, which is when influencers and creators start realizing that, hey, I can monetize my audience too. Mm -hmm. So this is like really cool because now artists, musicians, you know, even like the average person that has a nine to five job, they can actually create a business out of their passion because there's always going to be an audience for what you have to offer. So this is why it's really, really important. And then that goes into like the fourth generation, which is ownership. And this is where Web3 comes in because it's ownership, NFTs, owning your data and stuff like that. So this is kind of like, you know, a high level overview of why it's important to actually grow your fan base because we're in that era of like personal branding and those who create a good uh, personal brand and, and actually establish their own fan base they're going to be like super successful and way more successful in just general brands because people are getting tired of seeing like the big corporations win. Oh yeah, I agree with that one for sure. <laughs> and yeah, and it's a, it's a, it is kind of like that evolution of like the old record label model, and then it's like then the indies, indie labels, and then like individual artists started to realize they could release their own music and stuff like that. And now they're being able to like get that power back of being able to you know, monetize it more with things like NFTs and stuff. So I feel like it's kind of coming full circle, which is cool. Um, but before we get to NFTs, which I know is such a big topic, and it seems like on every call that I'm on with my students, they're asking questions about it, or they've heard about it, and they, they want more information. Um, but before we get to that, like, what does the actual term Web3 mean? Because people throw that around all the time. And I'm not even sure I know exactly what that refers to. This is a great question. <laughs> Web3 is such a big buzzword. It's actually a bigger buzzword than NFTs right now. And Web3 is basically like Web2 is the internet as we know it. It's run by like the big tech. And the best example that I can give you is like, remember how I was just sharing how first it was social media came around and then influencers came around. So if you kind of picture like this uh, circle and at the bottom of the circle, there's like a laptop. And the laptop, you go like there's a arrow going up and you have like a social media screen right there. So that's kind of like you reading what's going on, right? That's you being a consumer of, of the content. Now, when the second phase of the, of the, I guess, like the creator's economy, I guess you could say, second phase is actually when that social media, you actually realize that, hey, I can actually post and stuff like that. So Web3 is really like, that's all great that you can use the internet. It's all great that you can actually do everything you're doing. But Web3 is based on ownership. If I post something, it's going to be on the blockchain. So it's different in a sense that Web3 is based off the blockchain. So whatever you do, whatever you post, whatever you interact, whatever you're buying, selling, whatever there is, it's attached to you. Like you actually can prove ownership due to the blockchain. So it's like, you know, in, in the past when we would, use the social media platforms and we would use that to promote ourselves we were kind of putting ourselves in jeopardy because we didn't have control over that they could shut us down at any time and this is giving us more control over our content where it's like no you can't shut me down i have ownership of this and i can do whatever i want with it and monetize it is that pretty much what it is yeah it's it's like the next level of the internet got it Okay. And so another term that is related to that, that's also really big in the media right now is the metaverse. What exactly metaverse. does that mean? <laughs> I say it's it all like more... ominously, the metaverse. <laughs> yeah. And it's even more popularized right now because obviously Facebook just changed to meta, but the metaverse is like the virtual world. Um, and it's absolutely crazy because you can actually buy like virtual land, like virtual real estate, and there are people that are building, especially if there's companies that are building virtually because they know that this is, we all know that this is a future, like this is happening. So the metaverse is just kind of like this digital world where you, where you have av avatars, you can buy your land, um, you can do virtual shows and all these different things. And, and one of the biggest platforms for this is like Decentraland. And it's all, again, it's all crypto related, blockchain related. So it's just kind of like, if you guys ever get the chance to go on Decentralands, it kind of feels like a video game. <laughs> it really does feel like a video so it's game. Called, what is it called? Decentralized? 
Decentral land. De- Decentral land. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the metaverse platforms. Okay. Um, there's a bunch. I mean, there's I think the other one is called like Voxel City or something like that. But the one that I I, I had a lot of exposure to was Decentral land, and it's really cool. I actually went to a event at the end of December. Um, Finesse Media host a a summit in Decentraland. And it was really cool because they brought in their audience through Zoom. And you just saw like, instead of just seeing like Zoom faces, you actually saw like real people's avatars running around this map. And there's a, a screen and everything it was really cool. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> I, I've seen something like this, like an older version of this, where I don't know, like some platform that I was on, some business platform or like a community, they were trying to build something like this. And it was like the whole thing where like little things were moving around and you could go from room to room and things like that. <laughs> but I'm guessing this is a lot more advanced. Yeah. Cause it's like, you have to actually have a MetaMask, which is your, your crypto wallet to log in. And that way, if you want to buy like a different shirt or like a different outfit, virtual outfit, not even like real, um, it, it's it's all virtual. So you would just use your cryptocurrency, which is also tied to the whole Web3 and blockchain and all that. Got like it. So Ethereum. I have a seventh grade. Actually, she just went into it. She's now going into eighth grade. She is she plays certain games. Right. And she talks about that. Like, I want to buy this outfit or I want to buy this. I don't know, accessory or whatever it is. Um, but I've never actually like looked at her playing the game. Like do, do, are these like tiny little things or like, are you more immersed in the experience? I think it's more like immersed in the experience because like, it, I don't know if you like, I guess going back to school, right back to school. Like if you have an outfit and you're like, wow, you're so cool. You have that outfit. So now it's like, imagine that, but virtually where you don't have a tangible, but you're like, oh, wow, you have that like skin or whatever it's called, right? <laughs> right. And it's wearables. And I think Nike, Nike, I think did a really big investment with a, with a company. Um, I can't remember the name of the company, but they did a, a really big investment or partnership about creating virtual wearables. Wow. So yeah, it's, it's a whole new world. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is literally like a whole new world because it's <laughs> actually a virtual world. And, and so how, I mean, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but like Facebook, right? They just turned their, changed their name to Meta. Like, how are they going to fit into this whole new Meta world? Well, it's crazy because like I was just reading about this and other platforms, they charge maybe like a two, three percent fee. But Meta, like Facebook, they when I was reading the article, they were actually planning on charging 45 percent of like a transaction fee. And so, again, I think. I think it's going to be like interesting because I think Facebook has the power to actually help people realize that the metaverse and web three and that there should be mass adoption. But I think the people that are really, really like web three enthusiasts, I think that they're going to see pass through that because they understand that this is not about making the, you know, big tech even richer. It's really about like giving power back to the people. Yeah. And I think Facebook probably thinks they can charge that 45% because they've already amassed this huge audience, right? Yeah. The people are already there. Yeah. And they're missing you know, the point though. <laughs> yeah, no, they are. They're totally missing the point. And, and, and the, and the people that really get into it are going to be moving off of that platform and finding ones that are a lot more affordable and a little more, um, you know, like you said, like friendly to the, the smaller guy. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, I can see why they're thinking that. It's like, we already built this massive audience of billions of people or whatever. So they're already here. So we're going to capitalize on, that's why just why like, you know, in the old days, like stores, right? Could charge a lot more for things because that's the only place you could go or people were already in that. People were already at Target. So they're going to buy not just the one thing they went there for, but other things that they need. And then Amazon came along and they're like, um, no, like we're going to not do that. And we're going to have the best prices no matter what. And then they, they pretty much won out. So I, I think that's probably what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really interesting comparison and that's, that makes total sense. Interesting. Okay. So how do NFTs fit into all of this and why have they become such a big buzzword over the past, I'd say two years? Yeah, this is, this is a really good question. Um, so NFTs, the best way that I've heard an explanation for this, 
actually um jerry b from entre musician he oh my gosh he gave me such a good explanation that it just stuck so nfts really if you can think of like a jump drive right and you when you plug in the jump drive to your computer you have all this information and content right that's basically what an nft is but virtually so when you buy an nft you're not buying like the nft is just like a vehicle to the contents that you're actually buying Okay, so the NFT is the jump drive then in that in that analogy? Yeah, and the NFT basically just means that it's a one of one like it's it's uh it's it stands for not fungible tokens. So it pretty much just means that, you know, like the Mona Lisa, you can't replicate that, right? Once you buy it, you bought the original and it goes back to ownership because you can prove that you actually bought the original on the blockchain through your uh purchase through your smart contract and all that. Okay, so let me see if I can make an analogy that I think maybe artists are trying to to figure out. So I know like Patreon has been pretty big over the past, you know, mm-hmm. 10 years or so. Like how does do selling NFTs compare to like having a Patreon, right? Cause it's still like Patreon's still exclusive. Like you're getting access to things that other people aren't. It's like a paywall, but then NFTs, are adding that extra layer of like it being unique to you. Right. So how do you, how do you, how do you sell that in, you know, in being a different thing than like a Patreon? So there's multiple things. Um, I believe his name is Stevie Mackey. He actually had an NFT where he was actually selling an NFT, which was a sweater. And if you purchased the sweater, you had access to, I think he sold like 50 of them or something. But if you actually purchase his NFT, you had access to like a Taco Tuesday, uh, FaceTime with him, uh, like actual come to a live workshop with him, uh, take a vocal lessons with him and stuff like that. And once you got, once you did everything you wanted to do, you could then resell that NFT to someone else. So now someone else, they would swap it out. So let's say he has like a max of 50 people and 50 people come in. Then if you, if you resell your NFT, now you have a new person coming in, but you're coming out. And depending on the way that the NFTs are set up, like you can set up royalties and stuff like that. So every time you resell it to someone else, then the original creator gets a royalty. And that way the community wins as a whole, because you buy something, you resell it, you earn more money back while the original creator is still earning their royalties. Okay. So first of all, that's something that I love about NFTs, the whole setting up the royalty thing, because, you know, it's not like you buy something and then um, you know, you use it, but then you want to sell. So you go sell it at a garage sale and then a person buys it and then they use it for a while and then they sell it at a garage sale, you know, and the original person that made that thing doesn't get any money from those things. Yep. <laughs> and so I love this way of being able to continue. It's like a recurring income and you don't know when you're going to get it. Cause you don't know when that person's going to resell it, but it's, it's almost like those, those royalties that, you know, say you your song is used in a show or something. And then like all of a sudden, you know, Netflix buys that show like five years down the line, uh, they buy all those reruns. And then all of a sudden you start getting, you know, royalties out of nowhere. Right. So you're kind of setting yourself up for these things that might come down the line, but you don't know when that's going to happen. So I love that. I guess what I don't understand about NFTs in this situation is like, you're selling a thing, like you said, a sweater, but then it's all these like other opportunities are attached. And so those other opportunities that they get access to, does it just mean they get access to them and they'd have to pay more to get them or that they actually get them? So like all of a sudden they own this sweater and now they get to, you know, have one-on-ones with this artist or whatever. Is that like forever? Is that artist on the, on the so line for that? I think he, he, I think he capped it at like in his particular case, I think he ca- capped it at like once a year or something like that, or okay. like once a month, some, something like that, but it's not always like a tangible, right? Like a lot of, a lot of the things are actually digital art and it's, you know, some people might think like, well, why do I even want that? But there's, um, I don't know if you've heard of bored and hungry. So, uh, the, this these two guys in California they actually bought um, I'm blanking on the name board board ape yacht club NFT which is like the picture of this like uh, uh, ape 
And basically what they did is they actually went out and they bought a, or at least a space, like a restaurant space. And then they plastered the entire place with their NFT picture. So now there's actually like the first NFT restaurant out there and they, they can use it as, cause they own it. Right. So they can use it as their logo. They can use it as their branding. They can use it for everything. So that also increases the value of other people that are going to want to buy that NFT. And I think that NFT, like when I checked, it was like, I think a quarter of a million dollars or something like that. Um, (laughs) So some people might think like, you know, what, why do I want digital art? But if we also go back to thinking about the metaverse and if you are building a, a virtual house and you are building a virtual hangout space, having that those pieces of art it just represents like status right because it's like you can't duplicate that it's yours like you bought it um so it's not necessarily just like there's another case where someone bought an nft and the contents of that nft was an llc and the contents of the llc was actually a house so they bought a house through an nft that's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. And I hear all these crazy applications and I'm just like, yeah, but how do we work this for musicians? Like, it yeah. seems like these are insane, <laughs> but like, so I guess my concern is that like musicians, like in order to make their NFT seem desirable, maybe they add in a bunch of stuff. Like maybe, you know, you buy this NFT and then you get access to their concerts for life or as long as you own the NFT, but are they, are they stealing from themselves by doing that? Because as you and I know, like once someone's a customer, they're much more likely to become a customer again and buy more things. And so if you buy this NFT, that's like all inclusive and you get all these things that come with it, then you're not going to spend any more money. This is a good question. And I like, I definitely see the, I definitely see that. However, I think that NFTs is more like inner circle type of like people that are like super, super fans, because also as an NFT holder, you can have like, you can be part of like what's called a a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization. And it pretty much means that like as an NFT holder, as a token holder or coin holder, whatever it is, you actually can vote on decisions that they make. So, you know, like in traditional method, you have like the CEO at the top of the pyramid and then shareholders, gatekeepers, and then the people, the consumers. Whereas in the DAO, it's kind of like upside down. The people govern what's going on. And then that trickles down into the actual decision maker. So if you look at that from like an artist perspective, it's like your fans could have actually 100% full investment and say into what you do, which will only increase the fandom. True. And and I thought about it as you were describing that, just like stockholders, right? Um, They have a certain amount of decision-making power. Um, Does it ever, does the DAO ever get to the point where like the artist loses control of their own career (laughs) because the fans (laughs) are just making all the decisions? So that's, that's actually a good question. Um, I haven't really thought of that. Cause I always thought like, there's always going to be like a, a, like kind of like a leader of the pack. Um, and, and in, in the DAO community, it's more so like it's top contributors, right. The ones that contribute the most and stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of like a different leadership. It's still some sort of form of leadership, but I think, I think it's, I guess, depends how like the artist structures it. Um, but yeah, I think it's a better structure just cause like the people actually get to have a say. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it it definitely would definitely would increase your, you know, your engagement with your fans and them feeling like a part of it and them, you know, they actually own a piece of it. So they're going to be a lot more likely to like share and invite other people and all of that stuff, which can only be a win win, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And and there's also been cases where people like uh, like Blau, um, Blau also had like a really high. He had a really high NFT launch also. And, and it's not just like selling art, right? It's also like selling the music and delivering the music in a different way. There's artists that they've opted out of like releasing music from like Spotify and they actually deliver it through NFTs. So only a certain amount of people actually have the a hold of the music, but they make way more money from actually selling the actual music. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that because, and I see how that applies to art, right? Because art, Although in some ways, like in the old days of music, right? Like you could only, it was only reproducible. And then like you owned a CD, you couldn't really 
share it with other people. And, you know, art is kind of like that. But then when we went into the streaming world, like everyone can access the music, right? And I suppose in the metaverse, everyone could access someone's art if they set it up that way, if there was like a streaming art option where everybody could have that art in their house if they wanted. So I was trying to kind of think, oh, it would be, it would be different, but actually I guess it, it could work the same as what's happened to the music industry over time. But I just wonder, like, as an artist, I would have a really hard time not letting everyone hear my song. Like I created this thing. I want to put it out into the world. I want to have it, you know, affect as many people as possible. And yes, I want to make money. Right. So there's this balancing act, but like, do I really want to only sell it to a hundred people and only those people can enjoy that song? I think I would have a little bit of an like artistic problem with that. I don't know. I haven't done it yet, so I don't know where I'd be at, but what do you think? This is a really valid point. And I think I've seen some people that do like an NFT pre-launch and then they just release it to Spotify for everyone else but it still goes back to like the ownership, like you still own a part of the song. So, or like you own one of the copies of the song or whatever it is. So I think it really depends on like how you structure the launch of the song. But I I know I've seen cases where they still release it on Spotify after it's been sold as an NFT. That's interesting. So it's almost like somebody who were to release their music and like on a limited edition CD where they only had like 200 copies and then, every, you know, everywhere else it's, it's streaming and all that, but only, you know, those 200 people can actually own a physical piece of media with that music on it. So I guess that would be kind of akin to what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Back to like the deluxe CD editions. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah, doing, doing that NFT pre-launch makes a lot of sense. And I, I really love that idea. So it's, you're still not cutting people off from enjoying the music, but um, you know, certain people would still have, a- and if that song did really well, like say that song became a huge hit, then you'd have something super valuable if you had one of those NFTs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So what I've seen some of these, um, and I've heard some from my students who've been looking into this stuff and, and, you know, one of our mutual friends just launched a, like a, a, a music NFT marketplace. What do you think about that idea? It's smart. It's really smart. I think I think everyone should at least, if not jumping in, should at least be educating ourselves in this. Um, we're all learning as a whole world. We're learning because it's new to everyone. It's new to humanity. Maybe it's been around for like the past 10 years or so, but uh, but really it's starting to make a bigger impact now. And it was something that I also was kind of putting in the back burner. And I was like, well, yeah, I'll worry about it later. I'll worry about it later. And then one day I woke up and I was like, am I really going to procrastinate? Later is here. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Later is here. And am I really going to procrastinate like being a part and playing a role in this like transformation of wealth that we're seeing, right? This is a whole transformation of generational wealth. And then I kept thinking, well, when I, when the dot, dot com boom happened, I was too young So then I was like, well, obviously I couldn't play a role in that, but I have the opportunity to play a role in this one. So yeah, do I have to learn? Of course. And is it going to be always fun learning? You know, I think some people just hate learning. I I love learning, but um, it just goes down to that thing of like, whatever you do today, you're going to be so grateful that you did it three to five years from now because of how we're headed in the direction that we're headed in. And also like just looking at what, the major labels are doing and like reading their strategic plans of investment for the next year and all that. I realized that also they're placing a really big importance into web three and metaverse and they're investing very heavily into those spaces. So it's like, if they're doing it and we're not doing it, you know, something needs to change. And when you you go on like good point about that, we need to, to, to make sure to stay up with them if not get ahead of them (laughs) yeah get ahead of them and it's crazy like when you go on linkedin i just did this like two nights ago i went on linkedin and i just put like web3 as a job search thing uh, query and it was crazy there was like like all these companies are hiring it was like toyota's Mm -hmm. hiring web3 bumble's hiring web3 like all these different brands and companies that that you're like 
what are you guys doing in this space? <laughs> you know, like what's Toyota doing in this space? Um, but it's crazy. All the major labels are really heavily invested and, in, and it's, it's, it's crazy. Mm. Okay. So I, I think to your point, like where you said, I like learning and I love learning too, but I think what happens is that if people don't even understand the terms that are being thrown around when they start to learn, they're just like, Oh, this is not for me or I can't get it, which is why I wanted to break all of that stuff down first before we started getting into NFTs, because you hear these, these turn, you know, uh, gas fees and like that people throw those around. And if you don't know what they are, you just feel like, this is like another link. This is like trying to understand what someone's saying in Spanish and they're speaking, you know, a mile a minute. And I know 20 words in Spanish. I'm not keeping up. <laughs> It really is. I've been posting on LinkedIn every day, a web three word of the day. Cause it really is a whole, I new love language. that. Oh my gosh. I need to follow <laughs> you on LinkedIn. That's great. Yeah. There's one, my favorite one right now. Cause it just, it sounds funny, but it's like wag me like W A G M I wag me. And it means we're all, we're all going to, uh, where is it? We're all, we're all in this together or something like that. I, I don't remember the actual like that. phrase, but we're all going to make it. Maybe. Yeah. We're all going to make it. We're all going to make it. That's what it is. I was like, wait, it's something about we're all going to be constructing it. <laughs> we're all going to make it. And that is such a fun, fun word. So, <laughs> and that applies so much. I, at least to the way I've always wanted to see DIY musicianship, like it's all boats rise with the tide, right? We're all going to make it if we yeah. all, you know, help each other out. And, and we have this community idea of how music is spread. Yeah. So I love that. Um, as far as the, the, the mu like the music NFT marketplaces, what do you think, at least my understanding is that you would put your NFT on there and then somehow they would market it or they would have a community of people that were interested in that versus you going out to your own fan base and doing your own NFT and needing to, to mint it and all of that stuff. What do you think of those two options for artists? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, I haven't personally done my first NFT launch yet, but my understanding of it is that, yeah, you do want to do like, you want to go through the whole mint process and I think the, the most common one is like open seats actually listed on there, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like releasing a song or it's kind of like releasing any kind of project. Like you have to build buzz around it. Mm -hmm. If you actually want to have like a successful launch, right. You have to build a community. You have to build your audience. So it, it kind of goes back to like kind of towards the beginning where we were talking about like, why is fan base important? And it's super important because it doesn't matter if you're launching an NFT or a new course, or you're launching a new song or an album it's still the same process of like, you got to build that tribe of people that are kind of like rallying for the same thing. And if you do a good job at expressing that and, you know, with your music, especially you're building a community of like-minded people that resonate with the messaging of your songs, then it's kind of the same process for NFTs where you have to build that hype. Now there's one additional layer. If, if your community isn't into NFTs or crypto or any of that, the additional layer is actually teaching them how to do it right? Because everyone's learning. We're all learning. And I think a lot of the times the biggest setback is that people, you know, artists will get their NFTs ready. They went through the learning, they know how to do it. And then they launch it and they're like, the audience is just like, cool. I don't know what to do now. Oh my, that is such a good point. Cause I remember back <laughs> when streaming first started and, you know, we were, we were talking about educating your audience because, you know, a lot of our audience was still used to listening to on CDs or buying on iTunes or whatever. And we had to explain to them, no, this is streaming services. This is how they work. And this is what would be helpful to me. If you would follow me on Spotify, or if you would, um, you know, add my song, like create a playlist and add my song to it. So we tell them how they can help us and also how to do it. Like literally I would be like, you need to create like a loom video that shows them exactly how to do this because if they're, especially some of my students who were like their fan base was baby boomers. Like they did not know even how to like find Spotify in the app store and download it, <laughs> you know? So it's like, you need to, we all have to start somewhere and our audience might not be up to the level where we are yet and bringing them up to that point so they can actually, you know, buy from us and actually be involved in the launch that's a really good point. So like, do you have any recommendations of 
where artists can learn a little bit more about NFTs or like figure out how they can explain this to their audience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone that does an amazing job at this and he also has a YouTube channel and I know he does like, I think quarterly virtual events. Um, his name's Death Beach and it's literally just spelled like that. I think underscore on Instagram, Death Beach underscore, I think it is. And he is always sharing so much valuable information around this. He's also helped a lot of artists already launch their tokens and stuff like that. Um, he like, yeah, he's he's an amazing resource to, to learn from. Um, also the... The interesting thing I was reading about this other day, the Web3 community is still like, it's still relatively small. Like there's, they predict by the end of this year, we're going to be at 50 million. And by 2030, it's going to be a billion users. So we're wow. still like very early on, like at 50 million might seem like a lot, but it's still com- in the comparison to the whole world. It's still very small. The other thing too, to look into is, um twitter and discord a lot of people in the web3 space like just look for web3 servers crypto servers it's all about building community and because there is so much that needs to be built in this new phase of the internet everyone has that mentality of like what well, we want to help each other out and it's to the point where like even like coders are dropping their open source codes on like github so people can just swipe the code and keep building on top because there's so much that needs to be done so it's a really really awesome community Wow. Wow. It's almost like they're needing to build a town from scratch and everybody's coming together and like using their talents to like, okay, you, you know, you do, you build foundations and you do the painting and you do that. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. There's also Um, uh, two more people too. Um, Dao records. So it's DAO records. That's her handle on Twitter. mm -hmm. And it's run by this guy named Vandal and Vandal actually, he has They were doing, I don't know if they still are doing this, but they were doing like artist showcase in the metaverse and they had bought like their own piece of land in the metaverse to actually host the show, the artist showcases and stuff like that. And they're also like another, actually Vandal, from my understanding, he was actually one of the first people to create the use case of using NFTs to share audio. Mm -hmm. So another person to definitely check out. Wow. So let's just say back to the, the metaverse and the, all of that. Um, if, if you buy land in the metaverse and like, say you want to host a virtual show there, do you then sell like virtual tickets to the show? Is that how that works? This is a good question. (laughs) Cause like, Um, if you're having, do you like, you buy the land, like you pay an amount or do you pay like rent or (laughs) like who owns the land in order for you to buy it from them? So I think if I'm mistaken, I think you buy it from like the platform. Okay. Right. So like, I, like, I'm pretty sure, I don't know. Um, I, I've never purchased land, but I'm pretty sure you buy it from like the actual platform. And then, and then I guess when you own it, you can resell it and then they pay you. But, um, but in terms of like how you use your land, if you are charging for shows and stuff like that, it would all be through cryptocurrency. It wouldn't necessarily be through PayPal or Venmo right. or anything like that. Right. It would be through like your MetaMask or like your trust wallet or the wallets that you can, you can access the web threes through those apps on your phone. Got it. Okay. That's pretty, pretty interesting. And is that the same or different from like having a concert that's like in virtual reality? Like, is that, is that a different thing? Yeah, because the concert and like for example, like Deggy World, right? But Deggy World has a virtual uh, concert space, and for that, you just download a software on your computer, and then you're in, and then you can host and walk around and host your events and stuff like that. And it's still run by the U.S. dollar or your currency mm. wherever you're located. But when you go on like Decentraland, in order to log in, you actually have to log in with your MetaMask. So already you're like logging into Web three. Got it's it. A different okay. Level. Okay. So it's like everything is like crypto. Then once you're, it's in, almost it's like, like going to a different country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm trying to like relate it to things that I and my audience understand. So you know what I mean. Yeah. Wow. It's 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 a bit mind blowing sometimes to think about all of it. Um. So as we talked about, just to kind of like wrap all this up in a bow from what we talked about in the beginning, um. It's, it's really all about fan base because you're creating your own community in order to do this. And I always 
I see a lot of people get excited about things like, you know, for a while it was crowdfunding and then it was Patreon and now it's NFTs, right? These ways that artists see, oh, I can make money from this. Finally, I can make money from this. And they see that as the thing to pursue instead of the end result of pursuing the fan base first. And then you can have that. So a lot of times they like immediately pursue, let's say, a Patreon and they launch it, but they launch it into nothingness because, and they think it's going to bring in the fans. And I think I see artists this way with NFTs. Oh, if I have an NFT, like people will pay attention to me. They'll think that I'm cool and they'll want to invest, but why would they, they don't know anything about you. They're not your fan, you know? So I guess my question out of all of that rant was, um, is really like, how long do you, recommend that artists work on building their fan base before they do something like release an NFT? This is a good question. I think it really does boil down to community engagement and like fan engagement. And I think like if you bring your fans into the journey, then you're not going to be wasting your efforts because you're, you're kind of building everything. Like, you know, do you guys want to see an NFT or do you want to see a Patreon? And then you run polls and you ask people and you make them a part of it. And that way you start building the buzz and, you can even share like the backstories, right? Of like, you, I was working on my NFT today and, you know, I was working on the art and you're having issues or whatever the case is. And you can share those things so people can actually get an insight and learn as you're going through it. Um, so Katie Zaccardi, for example, she does an amazing job at that whole, you know, fan engagement and looking at sh like showing the behind the scenes and stuff like that. So I think that's really, really important because it doesn't matter if, if you're launching a Patreon or an NFT or whatever it is, it's bringing your audience into it. And a lot of the times is like, just kind of taking, taking your product aside, right? Forget about the product and the offer. What is the community that you're building? Like, what is the messaging? What is the vision? What is the mission? So why are all these people congregating? And a lot of the times those messages will come through your lyrics and your music. And that's how you kind of start bringing a tribe together. Um, quick example, Taylor Swift, right? Her fans are either going to be hopeless romantics or people going through breakups. That's mm -hmm. her music. So, <laughs> so it's like really think about the subjectivity of your music as you're building your community and your NFTs and your Patreons and, and those spaces. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I totally agree. Like that is the basis of fan base building. And I love the idea of maybe taking them on the journey with you as you learn. If you've been on this podcast and you're like, I want to learn about NFTs, I know nothing. Like, don't be afraid to say to your audience, like, hey, I want to learn about NFTs. I'm looking to, you know, release an NFT like a while down the road, but I don't want to do it uneducated and do it wrong and all of that stuff. And so I thought it would be fun to like share with you guys as I learn about NFTs and like take them on that journey. Don't feel like you have to be like, have everything all perfect in front of your audience, right? We're all going to make it. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> let me tell you, like, I mean, they're, if we all tried to be perfect in front of our audience, then we may as well give up now because I, you know, we always, there's always something we're going to do that is going to make us, you know, not look the way that we want to or whatever. And we're just human, right? So we need to be human with our audience and our community and, and just kind of go through it with them. And also that will educate them. So when you get to the point where you are going to release your NFT, they'll be like, oh yeah, this is what she's been talking about all this time. And I just don't, still don't totally understand it, but she seems super excited about it. So I want to jump in. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> love it. Love it. Well, is there anything else we didn't cover I mean, we didn't cover like a million terms that relate to, to Web3, which we can't possibly go into right now. But is there anything <laughs> else that's really important to this whole conversation that we might not have touched on? Um, I think we covered like pretty much a good, we have like a good foundation. Uh, one thing, one person also that just came to mind is... Sherry who I completely forgot to. Oh yeah. Earlier. I had her on one of my past po uh, uh, summits. She's yeah, really knowledgeable. She is in this kind awesome. Of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that was everything. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. And so where can 
they follow you if they want to, to, especially, I want to know about that uh, web three <laughs> word of the day. Word I think I day. need to follow that. I should start posting that on, on all you social should. outside of LinkedIn. Yeah. I would yeah. love to do that. You should do like a TikTok on that or something. Right. Web yeah. three word of the day. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, on all socials, my handle is, is word I Z Z W O R D. Definitely follow her. She drops knowledge bombs and value bombs all the time. So definitely <laughs> follow her, you guys. And thank you so much, Isabella. I feel like I've learned so much and probably ask a few questions that people that are really into Web3 are like, that's pretty basic. But I just really wanted to make sure I understood stuff because I don't want to like, you know, bring artists along on this journey if I don't know what I'm talking about. And I wanted all the artists that are listening here and follow this show to get a base knowledge. So when they're out there learning this stuff, then, you know, they're not going to be confused by anything that that's coming up. So thank you so much for all of this knowledge. You, you obviously, you, everything, I, whenever I would ask you a question, you'd be like, oh, the other day I read this, like, you're obviously very well <laughs> Uh, versed or you're learning all the time about this because you know that it is is the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bree. And I hope this was helpful. It was very helpful. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at profitablemusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.